Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Men's Life uh, Connecting. We thought we would try a couple of different things this year, and so uh, I think you're in for a treat. Our guest speaker is Ted Meyer, a Houston attorney, longtime MDBC member, elder, great uh, personal friend. He's got a new book out. You may have already looked at your uh, handout to see uh, that it's a new book about baseball, and we're going to have a conversation about it. I think it's going to uh, be edifying and even applicable to our overall theme. So welcome, Ted. Great to be here. Thanks, Brad. Glad you're here. Got your mic on. See how hello, hello. There we go. Yeah. Ready to go? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so Ted, tell me the what's the title of the book? And the title of the book is Championing the Cause of Leadership: A Look at the Baseball Dynasties. And basically, it's about the takeaways for business groups and teams uh, from the baseball dynasties. And it turns out we can learn a lot about leadership and organizational success and even personal success from these great teams. It's a, it's a book that's going to come out in January, actually. Um, it's going to be marketed as a business book and as a graduate business school text. So hopefully the business schools will be using it, too. So right off the bat, I want to ask you to define a dynasty. Because the San Francisco Giants, 2010, 12, 14, you know, three championships every other year. Is that a dynasty? Well, I had to have a test, and my publisher gave me word limits. And so <laughs> under my definition, unfortunately, it's not. No. And that was the challenge of this book, is, is I had to leave out a number of really great teams. Uh, but my definition of a dynasty that I came up with is that they had to win in successive years, they had to be great for a period of four years or more, and they had to be generally recognized by the historians as the best team of their time, which unfortunately excluded the 1990s Atlanta Braves because the, actually the Yankees were a better team during that era. So I've made some enemies in Atlanta yeah. by writing this book. They were so dominant throughout that whole decade. Your Giants team won every other year, but in the years that they did not win, they didn't play so well. No. So in my view and my limitations I had, I couldn't include them. So... So tell me, why would you write a book about baseball? What, what, what attracted to you to that sport in particular? Yeah, a lot of reasons. There's a lot of ways that baseball is like life. And, and, and baseball is, is an American game. It, it came up. It's not, it doesn't have a single point of origin, but it's kind of a result of rounders and cricket and town ball combined together. Um, it's been in our culture now for 150 years or so. Uh, our, our, our ancestors played this game. Um, even if you're not a fan or you didn't play, you have an ancestor somewhere down the road or on the way back that played. And at the turn of the 20th century, there was no radio and no television. So what people did is they went out and played baseball at night. And so there were town teams and there were prison teams and there were business teams and all kinds of baseball teams. Uh, so what, what emerges from this is this phraseology that we use now in modern life. Um, if you uh, have a great business presentation, you've hit it out of the park. Uh, somebody that's in trouble has two strikes against them. Um, if, if you have a bad idea, it's out of left field. And what this language does is it connects us in ways and, 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 and deeper than we even realize. We have meetings, lunches, business lunches, and somebody says, boy, you really knocked it out of the park. That's a deep connection because of the history of baseball and the fact that it's it goes way back into probably both families uh, and it's a, it's kind of a sign that hey we're connecting at a deep level here in this conversation we understand each other and and that's how that language uh, plays out it's so interesting because I can't think of anything other than scripture where we have grafted so much of that into our vernacular you know uh, in scripture I think of you know handwriting on the wall and other obvious things that uh, even are in secular conversation. So tell me what motivated you to write a book in the first place. I mean, because that's what you took on. That's a tremendous amount of effort. Yeah, it's, it's really been a labor of love. Um, when I was in law school, they were starting to tell us that we lawyers needed hobbies to get away from the, the grind of our profession. And so I chose studying baseball history. Um, and I started about the same time I started practicing law, about the same time I became a member here. And I began to read baseball uh, every, basically every night. And I just became fascinated, not so much with the current game, uh, but the history of the game. The history of the game is fascinating, not just the major leagues, but the Negro leagues. And, uh, and, and about 10 years ago, I realized that 
I have a story to tell. There's something here that, that, I, that, I, can, that I can write about. Uh, and about five years later, I started to focus on the dynasties and the similarities among the dynasties. And, and finally, I got serious about it about two years ago, and this became my COVID project. So rather than gain 20 pounds, I decided to write a book. It's a really great idea. What, uh, give me an example of one of the great takeaways from your life. Yeah, well, most of us are familiar with the New York Yankees of 1996 to 2000. It's the team with Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera. And we probably all know who Joe Torre is. Joe Torre was the manager of that team. Um, well, the history of Joe Torre is very interesting. He was a very good player in his day, and at the end of his career, he began managing. He managed for the Mets and the Cardinals and the Braves. But he was fired from all three jobs. And um, at the end of his, the, that third uh, stint as a manager, he had the dubious distinction of the most games combined, played, and managed of someone who never made the World Series. And this, is, this brings us up to about 1995. And it was after his third firing when his wife pulled him aside and said, Joe, there's something about you I don't know. There's something you hide from me. There's something that's keeping us from getting close. And so she was able to bring him to basically a marriage couple seminar at a Holiday Inn uh, in St. Louis. And it's a little bit like home encouragement, I think. Uh, and Joe Torrey stood up and they were asked to talk about things in their lives that they'd never really talked about. And Joe Torrey stood up with tears streaming down his face before these, this room of strangers and talked about his father, who was a, a New York police detective who abused his mother. And uh, he, this was a very large man. He had a gun. He was a police officer. And so Joe and his brothers couldn't do anything about it. And Joe Torrey never learned to confront anything. And so there are stories of him driving home from school on his bike when he was nine years old and see his dad's car in the driveway, and he'd just keep going. So uh, th this was something that Joe's wife had never heard about, but it brought it out into the open. Joe began to speak about it, came to terms with it. He starts with the Yankees in 1996, and it's a great team. They make the World Series. But what's interesting is what happened in the World Series. They were playing the Atlanta Braves. Uh, they lost game one in New York. And, of course, George Steinbrenner comes in his office after the game and says, hey, we, this, next one, this next one is a must-win game. Uh, Joe Torre is sitting at his desk, and he doesn't even look up. He says, George, you should be ready to lose this game too. Uh, but then we're going to go back to Atlanta, which is my hometown, and we're going to win this World Series in six games. Um, so the Yankees uh, lose the first game in New York to the Braves. Just like he said. Just like he said. In game two, they lose as well. They, they get shut out by Greg, Matt, Greg Maddox, 4 to nothing. So they're down 2-0 going back to Atlanta in this World Series. I think we have a picture of Joe. If we yeah. Can put it up. Keep going. So in game three, uh, the Yankees go ahead 2 to nothing, uh, but they get into to, to the sixth inning, and David Cohn's pitching, and he loads the bases. So Joe, Joe Torrey comes out on the field, and uh, you can, can we see the picture yet? Can we have um, it up again? Okay. Um, J Joe Torrey comes out on the field, and he confronts David Cohn, and he gets right up in his face, and you can see this photo. That's Joe Girardi is the catcher, and he's no shrinking violet, and he's looking away because he can't believe what's going on. <laughs> Torrey gets up in Cohn's face and says, this is very important. I need the truth from you. How do you feel? And, and, and Cone said, well, I, I feel pretty good. I can probably get him out with a slider. And, and Torrey steps one step closer to him and is literally inches from his face and says it again. I need the truth from you. How do you feel? This is very important. Well, Cone ultimately got out of the inning. The Yankees won the game, and they went on to win the series in six games. Uh, David Cone said later he will, he will never forget this moment because of the eye contact. Mm from Joe Torrey. Mm -hmm. he's, he's out in a hostile crowd, mm -hmm. you know, with fans uh, booing, and we all know these games as Astros fans. We know what these momentum shifts are like. And he's out there standing straight up, speaking slowly in short declarative sentences, looking this guy right in the eye. He's completely differentiated from what's going on around him. Absolutely. And he, uh, he learned to confront. And, 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 and what the takeaway here is that well, Joe Torrey, by this, completely transformed himself as a leader at age 55. He turned it around. That, that was the, the missing link. 
Uh, but what, what we learn from this is to connect, sometimes we need to learn how to confront people on very tough things. Mm -hmm. And uh, his whole life he'd avoided it. And now, now he had learned to handle it and it made him a much better leader. Yeah, wow, that's a very powerful story. So uh, this book, if you're talking about dynasties and we've already kind of cleared up what qualifies as a dynasty from, from your point of view. Uh, no, and I agree with you. The New York Yankees have won 27 championships. I mean, is this basically a book about the Yankees? There, Don't tell me that. There are five Yankee dynasties that I cover in this book, but maybe the most interesting of the five is how one of them crashed. And um, the, the, the Yankees between 1923 and 1962, a period of 40 years mm -hmm. inclusive, won 20 world championships. So they had, a, they had a history and a legacy going that was unbelievable. Uh, that 1960s team was Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, Whitey Ford, etc. cetera. Uh, they won in 61 and 62, but in 1963, they, they got swept by the Dodgers, and they barely won in 62 against the Giants. Mm -hmm. In 1964, they got beat by the Cardinals. 1965, they didn't make the World Series. They lost more games than they won. And in 1966, they finished dead last in the American League, 26 games out of first place. Amazing. So the question is, what happened? And why did this team crater? And that is very interesting. There were basically three reasons. The first reason is that they did not embrace bringing black players to their team. They brought Elston Howard to the team in 1955, mm -hmm. but they fell behind the pace of the frequency and numbers of black players. And so the Giants brought more players in, the Dodgers, the Cardinals. They were all, they all went ahead of the Yankees because of the number of black players they brought in uh, who added to the team. They mm -hmm. added to the mix. They made their teams better. Uh, the second thing is the game changed in the 1960s. The mound was raised. The strike zone was widened. So it became a pitcher's game. Mm -hmm. Speed and defense became a premium. And the Yankees just ignored it. Um, they, they just kept playing Yankee baseball the way they already always had, and they didn't change. And uh, in the immortal words of Brad Pitt playing Billy Bean in <laughs> Moneyball, adapt or die. That's right. And they didn't. They yeah. just kept going. But, and more pitches were being developed. And right. Uh, more just pitches. a lot of change. A lot of change. And yeah. they, they just simply refused to change. Mm -hmm. But maybe one of the most interesting things is how they handled their main superstar, Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle was a great player. And he even, looks even greater today with modern-day sabermetrics, which have been retrofitted to these old teams. Mm -hmm. And he's, his on-base percentage was very high, so he looks even better than he did before. But he was an alcoholic. And he brought all the qualities of an alcoholic to that Yankee team. And while he would be very friendly to some of the rookies, he would lead them astray, would take them out on his excursions at night. He was a known carouser. Um, and uh, there's this, this one example of, he had been out the night before, could barely get up. His handlers brought him to Yankee Stadium, got him into the game. He got up for his first at bat in the first inning. First pitch, hits a home run. And as he runs to first base, he runs past the bag. Instead of turning to second, he just drifts out into right field. <laughs> Doesn't even know where he is. And, of course, all the young players think this is, this is hysterical. But they learn that, wow, you can go out and live that lifestyle and be great. Mm -hmm. Well, no. And, and ultimately, the Yankees did not manage Mantle. They, they let him sort of be himself. They let him be his dysfunctional Mickey Mantle and do what he wanted and, you know, back chat management and mm -hmm. do all sorts of things. And so um, they, they did a horrible job of handling him, and he just, he really declined in the, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s as his alcoholism got worse. Uh, compare this to, what, to the way the 1920s Yankees handled Babe mm -hmm. Ruth. In 1925, Babe Ruth reported at, at spring training weighing 256 pounds, which was 35 pounds over his playing weight. Like Mantle, he was a carouser. He was a drinker. He was out. He would not come into curfew or come in and meet curfew. And on August 31st of 1925, he came into the clubhouse late for a game in St. Louis against the St. Louis Browns. And uh, his manager, Miller Huggins, said, Ruth, you're not getting dressed today. You're suspended. Uh, and he fined him the astronomical sum at the time of five thousand dollars. Can you imagine telling Babe Ruth, yeah, you know, the greatest, especially when you're about five foot four and 125 <laughs> right, yeah. pounds, which Miller Huggins was, and Ruth tried to intimidate him and push him around, and then yeah. and then Ruth went to the owner. He went to Jacob Rupert, and he went to the general manager Ed Barrow. And the key of that team is that the managers stay aligned, the leadership stayed aligned. Mm 
Mm -hmm. They didn't allow it to happen. Uh, Barrow was amazing. He was the original owner of the great Yankees. Mm -hmm. uh, and he went public when, when Ruth started to spout off in the press and said, Miller Huggins is my manager. I'm with him until the end. Babe Ruth will remain suspended as long as Miller Huggins wants him to be suspended. Mm -hmm. um, so you had the owner, you had the GM, and the manager who were all in sync. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so Babe Ruth never bothered Miller Huggins again. He went out and hired a personal trainer. And from 1926 to 1931 inclusive, Babe Ruth went on a hitting streak that has been unequaled in the history of baseball. He averaged 50 home runs, 155 RBIs, and hit 347 over a six-year period. Uh, and the, the lesson learned here is that we have bullies in our workplace. We have high-performing rainmakers and salespeople who kind of try and get away with this stuff. And um, the key is standing up, standing up to the bullies, keeping the management team aligned, coming up with a plan and sticking with it. Because if we don't do it, those people will just run amok. And then all of a sudden, you're losing people you want to keep, and it becomes a mess. They feel like they can get away with it because they're rainmakers. They're really right. bringing income into the company or whatever. But uh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, just keeping Mantle in check. They had enough problems with Yogi Berra checking out, and yep. you had Jim Bouton and uh, others that were playing injured that they forced to play while they weren't up to playing. Right, and that was one of the things, one of the changes they didn't realize is they had these players that were aging prematurely. Tony Kubek and Tom Tresh were both out of baseball by 29, age 29, and they were both supposed to be great stars. And who knows what the, the, the toll of the late night activities took on all those guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell me, are baseball dynasties, in your opinion, are they the result of good pitching, good offense, or good defense? Yes. <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is what you learn about the dynasties is there's so many, so many similarities. They all learned how to confront fear because there's fear in that game. There's fear in being in these big, uh, high-exposure playoff games. There's fear standing up to a pitcher who's throwing the ball 98 miles an hour and loses his control, particularly back before batting helmets when these guys would step in. So there's that team ability to confront fear. That's a serious life or death threat without Absolutely. batting helmets. So. Yeah, they, they, these teams learn to innovate like no other. Um, I studied the Negro Leagues, we'll talk about them in a little bit, but the Kansas City Monarchs, for example, came up with their own uh, portable lighting systems. They would take lights on the road. They had. They had night games before the major leagues did, mm -hmm. and they needed to play extra games to get through the depression and make it. Mm -hmm. So um, there are just a number of ways that these teams innovated. But maybe the most interesting thing about the dynasties is each one of them had to get through a, some kind of crisis for the team to really connect and come together. And, and the best example I have of this is the 1973 Cincinnati Reds, who had already been to the World Series twice and lost. They'd gone in 1970 and 1972, and they'd lost in the World Series. Mm -hmm. 1973, they're playing the Mets in the National League Championship si Series. And this is one of those best out of three, or best out of five, three out of five series, mm -hmm. where they play the first two in one city and the next three in the other. I still don't figure out, ha haven't figured out why they did that, but that's the way they did it. Uh, and, and, the, and the central character in this was Pete Rose. And the, 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 the Mets went public in New York in the press claiming that the Reds were chokers, that Rose was a choker, et cetera. So the, the Reds set out to, to make a statement. And in game three, Rose, uh, in, in stealing second base, uh, took out Bud Harrelson. And it's this famous play of them getting into this huge brawl out in the middle of Shea Stadium. And the fans went crazy. And when Rose went out to left field in the next inning, he was pelted with everything from beer cans to whiskey bottles, batteries, uh, washers, nuts, bolts, all this stuff was thrown at him. And they actually had to pull the Reds off the field. The Yankee or the Mets had to send uh, Tom Seaver, Yogi Berra, their manager, and Willie Mays, who was on the team, out to the crowd to get them to calm down. Uh, and they finally did, and they finished the game. The Mets won that game. Game, game four was also in New York. Well, Pete Rose hit a home run in the 12th inning to win the game. And as he ran around the bases, he did this. And that just brought all that same stuff, came <laughs> flying right back at him. And, and the crowd was extremely hostile. So that takes us up to game five, the final game. They're 2-2 they're going into this game. 
And it's pretty clear the Mets are going to win. The Mets are ahead 7-2 to two in the ninth inning. Uh, and the, the Reds have their wives and families behind them, behind the dugout. And so what they decide to do is they have them, they escort them out of the stadium, down onto the field, but out through the dugout. So Because they know that otherwise they're going to have to go out back into this, into this crowd, the fans. Um, and so they get, a couple of them get kind of jostled, their hair pulled. It's really, it's really turning ugly. And so we get down to two outs in the ninth inning. The Reds, this is the last Reds at bat uh, in, in Shea Stadium in New York, and, and this is what happens. Let me tell you two clip. Doug McGraw gets the sign, goes into the motion. Here's the two-strike pitch. Swung on, hit on the ground toward first. Milner has the ball. Looks to McGraw. It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant, and this is a wild scene. Fans are pouring out onto the field. A mad scene at Shea Stadium as the New York Mets have won the National League pennant. Lindsey Nelson at his best. <laughs> uh, did anybody see Pete Rose? He was on first base running to second <laughs> when that ground ball uh, was hit. And the fans actually broke through. The, the, they, they broke down the, the wall and came out on the field. Zero security. So the Reds are, are at that point, they're just it's sheer terror for them. Um, they really don't know the state of their family or where they are. Uh, Johnny Bench yells, everybody get a bat. And everybody got a bat and they had to go out and they had to get find Pete Rose to get him off the field and there's these anecdotal stories of a bench hitting some poor kid in the shins with a bat and, and all this stuff and then the Reds went back and with the New York police basically barricaded their dugout so that fans couldn't get into their dugout it was it was a mess um, they finally got out to their bus and by the time they got out there the New York fans had figured out which bus was the Reds and they almost tipped it over they were teetering it from five. Some, somebody brought a bugle to the game and was playing taps, <laughs> who played it for an hour out by, by the bus. Um, it was just astonishingly scary for them. Yeah. Uh, and you look at it now and you just can't believe it happened because our security is so much better. But the, the takeaway from this is, is the Reds bonded as a team. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, Rose and Bench had never really gotten along. Uh, they weren't really all in as a team. And they became a team. And then they went on to win in 75 and 76 uh, and were one of the greatest dynasties ever. And, and this is what I've noticed with our teams and our businesses is we have to sometimes get through a great crisis together to really become our best. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it's a pandemic, maybe it's a hurricane, maybe it's a death in the company, whatever. Um, there's opportunity in crisis. Mm -hmm. So when this sort of thing happens to your group or team, um, rather than worry about it or feel sorry for yourself, try and seize the opportunity mm -hmm. because it's a great, it's a great opportunity to, to, for bring alignment, things, for to establish connection yeah. between your team. Yeah, members. that's good. I, I'm just, it reminds me of how many great characters there were, particularly in the 70s, and I think about Charlie Finley and all the crazy things he did with the, with the Oakland Athletics and... Um, we haven't talked about this before, but uh, his idea, his dream of that no Major League Baseball player would sign a contract longer than one season, that would have changed free agency. Oh, absolutely. Bit, absolutely. Free agency was, was non-existent until 1976. All the players had in their contract a reserve clause that tied them to their team for another year, and, and so they had no negotiating leverage at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what about under the radar players? Why, um, why are they? This is the thing maybe that, that interested me most, most about these great dynasties is they all had a, an under the radar player who was not a Hall of Famer, uh, typically didn't make the all-star team, but was there in the clutch in games toward the end of the year. It's kind of our, like our Yuli Gurriel. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just, we as, as, as Astros fans know how great he is because he always seems to step up in big moments. But there were players like this on all the dynasty teams. There was Phil Rizzuto who played for the Yankees who was 5'6 and 140 pounds and won the MVP one year as a, as a second baseman. The Scooter. The Scooter. There was Cesar Geronimo who played for the Reds. Um, and then there was a guy named Bobby Brown who played for the New York Yankees in the late 1940s and early 1950s, who was probably the most extraordinary person I met in this whole journey. Hmm. Yeah, can't wait to hear more about him. So um, tell me how important it is, how necessary is personal chemistry 
to a championship team? Do, do they have to like each other? I yeah, mean, it's, you're it's, talking about bench and rows. Yeah, I mean, who, chemistry is overrated. Um, uh, most of these teams had big, big conflicts within their team. Uh, one of the teams I study is the early 20th century Chicago Cubs with the famous uh, infield of Tinkers to Evers to Chance, great double play combination. Greatest uh, in all of history. Well, yes, and part of that Franklin B. Adams poem that we all learned when we were grade, in grade school. Um, but uh, they got in, a, in an argument in 1905 over cab fare, which led to a brawl between the two of them on the field, the shortstop and the second baseman. And they didn't talk to each other for 33 years. <laughs> and they were the second baseman and the shortstop on probably the best three-year run in the history of the game. Um, I, I, had a, I found a number of examples of this as I interviewed players. There was a, a pitcher for the Finley A's named Bob Locker, who was basically the setup man for Raleigh Fingers. And he recalled pulling players off Reggie Jackson <laughs> in, the, in the clubhouse on multiple occasions because the, the A's would just fight with each other all the time. Yeah. Uh, Ruth it, well, I'm sorry, I have a sidebar question about Reggie Jackson and yeah, the A's. What, yeah. what team was better, his Oakland A's or his New York Yankees later in the 70s? He was asked that question and said it was the A's. Mm -hmm. The A's were a better team. So the team that hated him most, that's the team that was... Right, he thought they were the best team he played for, and they probably were. Yeah. Uh, Ruth and Gehrig did not get along. They didn't speak for three or four years due to some fight between uh, Gehrig's mother and Ruth's wife. And... So, but, but, and we have this, we have people, we, we don't get along with some of the people we work with and we have people on our teams that don't get along. The key though, is not to become kumbaya, go to counseling or whatever you do. The, the key is to rise above it and, and focus on the higher objective of what's best for the team or the company or the group and, and get beyond it. Yeah. I, I, I'm always fascinated by the Pete Rose, Johnny Bench thing. I mean, Johnny Bench said Pete Rose should not be in the hall of fame. I think Rose came back and said if it wasn't for him, Johnny Bench wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame because Johnny Bench knocked him in a thousand times. He was on base so many times that right. he was able to hit him in. You know? Well, I was, I was at the Hall of Fame last month with a number of my friends, including Dick Ebling, who was one of the editors of my book. And um, there is, Pete Rose is engaged in a huge campaign to get into the Hall of Fame. And there's actually more in the Hall of Fame now on Pete Rose than Joe DiMaggio, which is really unfortunate, but he's not, he hasn't given up. Yeah, well. Uh, but, but in terms of getting along, the Reds had a problem with, uh, with Rose and Bench and Tony Perez and Joe Morgan. They really weren't, a lot, no, they really didn't know where they stood. They were all sort of an alpha male. And Sparky Anderson came in, and, and the way he dealt with it is he put them each in a corner in the clubhouse. So each of them had basically a corner office, saying to the team, these, guys, these four guys are all leaders, but they're all equal. And it was a very effective way of dealing with that discord. Still can't believe the Astros traded away Joe Morgan, but I'm over it. Yeah. So uh, kind of a related question, do players and coaches, um, do they need to both work and play together off the field? Yeah. How, how that, necessary is that? I think socializing is actually very important. And there's, there's many examples of this um, among the Yankees. This is one of the things they did. Is, is the, at least the older Yankees before the most recent version of, of the Joe Torre team, there were no clicks on the team. And if you were a rookie and you came down into the hotel lobby with nothing to do on the road, there was always somebody there to go to a movie with you. And, and, and what this do, did, I think, for the Yankees is, is it allowed young players to emerge more quickly. There, it, in some organizations, there's this sort of light form of hazing where they want to keep the young players down. And the Yankees realized that they wanted to actually inspire confidence in those people. They wanted to encourage them. And, and they're, the, they're the people that would come to the, come to the forefront in the big moments, uh, the, the, the young players. But, they, but if, had they been given confidence by their team, they were a lot more likely to do that. So I believe that, 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 that spending time together, getting to know each other, and connecting off the field is very important. Sure can't hurt. So shifting gears a little bit, a lot of issues percolating today in society, in corporations about race and diversity. How does your book... Speak to that applicably. Well, uh, as, as, as we know, uh, for at least 70 years, the organized wing of the American pastime systematically discriminated against men of color, kept them out of the game. Uh, but what developed was, was the Negro Leagues. And I actually studied the Negro Leagues in my book, and there were three of those teams that um, were great and were dynasties. The Pittsburgh Crawfords, 
uh, the Homestead Grays and the Kansas City Monarchs. And the, uh, the Homestead Grays were, were, they were all three great teams. They were all dynasties in their own right. Uh, the noted historian Bill James has put together a, a, his list of the top 100 players of all time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he included the Negro Leagues. And, and, and on that list uh, are a number of Negro League players, including Oscar Charleston, who nobody really knows about, but he's ranked number four on the list all time behind Ruth, Willie Mays, and Honus Wagner. That's amazing. And he was a great player. I mean, pit, pit, pit players that people that saw him play and saw Willie Mays play said Charleston was clearly better. He would wow. basically, uh, he was an outfielder, but he would camp out right behind second base and be a fifth infielder. And he could go back on the ball. And he was, he was just this amazing player. So there's all these great stories of the, of the Negro Leagues. We, we actually had a stadium here called the West Side Stadium uh, where the, uh, the Negro Leagues played back in the 1920s and the 1930s in Houston. And it was right at the corner of Jefferson and Bagby downtown. There was a stadium there. Um, and the, actually, the, the old St. Louis Browns and now the Baltimore Orioles would, mm -hmm. would go there for spring training. So I learned a lot about these men. Um, they did so much for integration in America. They would travel throughout the country, having to play two or three games a, a, a day to make it. Uh, they, would, um, they, they went across America. They didn't play just in their own league, but they would travel across America, and they would play home team, or, you know, home t town teams and you know, all-star major league teams. They, played, they would basically play 200 games a year or so. And they did more for the, the social justice movement and the race movement as anyone in the 1930s and 1940s because they would connect with these largely white towns. They would come in, they would play their games, they were great to the fans, they would go into the fans and shake their hand, mm. and they did more for race relations, I think, than they're, than they're given credit for. Um, with all those odds against them. I mean, I yeah. think of the Philadelphia Giants, they had like four or five different names. The, Elite uh, Giants. Yeah, uh, the Leland Giants, 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 Page yeah. Fence Giants. Uh, they had the yeah, line and, with... and, and, and throughout the South, towns, uh, you know, hotels wouldn't take them, restaurants wouldn't take them. They couldn't stop and go to the bathroom. It was just awful for them. And they were on these old ramshackle buses that went over these country roads. And they didn't have 25 players in a taxi squad. They had 16 guys, mm. and they had to play no matter what. So there were, there were no strains or sprains or, you know, discomforts or anything like that for them. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, coming forward to today, we, we, we now talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. And I think these guys had a lot to, to getting us here. Most of you in your organizations have diversity and inclusion officers and people in charge in that, of that sort of thing. And I think everyone is at a point now where we all know that, that diversity is good. I don't, I'm not sure we all know why it's good. And so I spend a lot of time in the book talking about why it's good and the practical advantages of it uh, because we as leaders particularly you younger guys is you're going to have to explain to the next generation why diversity and inclusion is important why it's good and and I, I go through a number of things in the book but one of the things that that I talk about is the concept of group think and that's what happens when you have a bunch of people in the room who are all alike and they're faced with a big problem they all think the same way, and there's a book that they follow, and they, they come up with the same solution that everybody else comes in. This comes is up what with. we do in this This situation. is right. Yeah. But when you have people from different places, <laughs> from different cultures, uh, when you have real diversity, you have people that are, you get everybody's idea, and there is this creativity that happens where the greatest ideas tend to bubble to the surface and solve the problem. And a, a practical example of this is when you you get together with somebody you really respect um, and you have a conversation and you just feel great coming away from the conversation. It's like I feel when I sit down and talk to you. I come away feeling better about myself, a little, maybe a little bit smarter, a little bit more enlightened. It's definitely mutual. And I think that's part of what happens with diversity is there's that extra level of energy and creativity that happens and, and allows us to solve the problem when maybe we couldn't otherwise. So it's very important. Um, I'm sure that everybody is, is embracing it uh, but we need to understand why we're embracing it, and that's part of what the book speaks to. Yeah, excellent. So back on the field, vocal leadership, how important is that? You know, I think about the Astros, the, our two Hall of Famers, Bijou and Bagwell, who weren't vocal. They didn't have to be. Bagwell could just cut a player a look, and that would yeah. pretty much take care of things. So. Yeah, lots of different leadership styles. I think the, the important thing is not whether you're a player's manager or whether you yell at them, is, is are you authentic? Are you being yourself? 
And uh, one of the great examples of that was the old case or the old Yankees manager Casey Stingle, maybe maybe the best manager in baseball history. Um, and he used he was famous for his Stingleese. So he would say things like, "There comes a time in every man's life, and I've had plenty of them." Um, <laughs> and and so there's all these examples of Stingle's humor and wit. And and once he came out on the mound to remove a pitcher, and the pitcher was exasperated and said, "I'm not tired." And Stengel said, well, I'm tired of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was Casey Stengel. He was just always goofing around, always funny. Uh, but he kept the team relaxed. And you can see this the, in the old World Series footage. The oldest uh, broadcast tape that's available, we think, is the 1953 World Series, the Yankees against the Dodgers. And the, Do the Brooklyn Dodgers were up three games to two in game six and seven in Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. So... So you think that Brooklyn's got the advantage, and they, they, they pan to the dugouts, and they show the, the Dodgers, and they're, they're all tight and buttoned up, and the Yankees are just relaxed. Stingle's out there waving his arms around for who knows what reason, and they're loose. And it was his style, his humor, his ability to keep people relaxed in big moments that made the difference. They're not taking themselves too seriously. Right, and he's not sure not trying to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. He's himself, yeah. and I think that's the key. In, in real key moments and key times for leaders is to be authentic. Yeah. So do you think great managers of all time versus superstar players, I mean, who really gets the credit for these great teams? Yeah, I, I think the key that you see in the dynasties is you see a manager-like player who was on the field. Uh, and, and the one great example in the book of this is a guy named Harry Hooper who played for the Boston Red Sox of the 1910s. They won four World Series in eight years. It was when Babe Ruth pitched and Tris Speaker played for that team. Harry Hooper was an under-the-radar guy who played right field. But as the Red Sox went through that decade, they faced uh, the, pan the, the Spanish flu, World War I, and there were all these obstacles. And so they had, a, they had a turnover of managers. For the four years they won, they actually had three different managers. And it turned out uh, later that Hooper was actually running the team from right field to the point where he was even calling in, he was calling pitches into the catcher to give to the pitcher. Uh, I mean, he did, uh, he, 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 he basically moderated a player strike, uh, almost player strike in 1918 when it became clear because of World War I and gate receipts being down that the players in the World Series were not, maybe not going to get their World Series share. And back then that was everything to them. That was more than their salary. And so the two teams in the, in the series, the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago White Sox, began to sort of organize together on the trains as they rode to, to and from. And they, they were going to strike. And they showed up in Chicago, and these players were getting ready to strike at the same time that in the crowd they led in to an applause of, of 50 or so World War I war vets who were missing limbs and, and so on. And, and Harry Hooper realized that the last thing in the world they needed to appear as at that point were greedy ball players, mm -hmm. and so he actually led both teams. There's this famous story of a meeting in the locker rooms where they came together, mm -hmm. and Hooper led them. He was basically a, a Marvin Miller of, of the time, wow. but he was a great leader, and, and it transcended the field. Um, the things he did, I, I just go on and on and on. He was a, he was a, just a, exa the epitome of of the player you need on a great team. I would love to go on and on, but we're running out of time. Yeah. Greatest team, not to scoop your book, but. Uh, that's tough to say. Most people say that Murderer's Row Yankees of the 20s. A lot of people say the recent Yankees team of 1998 that won 114 games. Some think it's one of the Negro League teams. I happen to think it's the 1936 to 1941 New York Yankees. It was the end of Gehrig's career, uh, the beginning of DiMaggio's career. Uh, for the five years they won in those six, they won the American League by an average of 20, or I'm sorry, f average of 15 games each year. And their World Series record over those five years was 20 and four. <laughs> and they were, I, I don't think there's any question in my mind that they were the best, probably the best team. And so the greatest player? This is another one where I, I get a lot of debate. Uh, most people say Babe Ruth, a lot of people say Willie Mays. A uh, more modern version is with some as Barry Bonds. I, I actually think it was Joe DiMaggio. And the reason I say that is if you, if, you, if you define greatness as the value that a player had to his team, 
it's got to be DiMaggio because when he came to the Yankees in 1936, they'd been out of the World Series for three years. Gary had sort of been the de facto leader, but he really wasn't ever to get, to get them over the hump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, DiMaggio came in and turned that team around from an average of five games behind to, to 15 games ahead. So he was a, basically a 20-game difference, and there's nothing like it in the history of baseball. Uh, and modern statistics have not been kind to Joe DiMaggio. All the war and all the, the statistics really don't recognize what he did in big games and big moments. But if you really study it, I think it's Joe DiMaggio. He made things happen for sure. Right. Uh, last thing, talk to me about one individual person that you would like to highlight. In the yeah, book. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, Bobby Brown. Uh, he was with the Yankees from 1946 to 1952, or actually parts of those seasons. Uh, he, to this day, he was not an all-star, didn't make the Hall of Fame, is, isn't known by very many people. Most people think Bobby Brown was the singer in the 80s. They don't know the baseball player. <laughs> uh, he, um, he is second all-time in World Series batting percentage for players with over 40 plate appearances. He's second to Big Poppy Ortiz. He hit 436. He was the epitome of what was, what was there in big games. Um, so as I read more about these Yankees, I kept, I read about the series, I kept coming across this name, Bobby Brown, and I was fascinated with him, and I wanted to find out more about him. So I began to study him, and it turns out that during the time he played with the Yankees, he also went to medical school. He was a full-time medical student in, at Tulane uh, while he played. So he was never able to go to spring training. Um, and he had come from uh, Stanford and, and, and UCLA, and, and, and in his three schools he played on all three of the baseball teams averaged 500 (laughs) for his college baseball career made it to the hall of fame of all all three of those schools um i'm still stuck on the fact that he never went to spring training he never went to spring training and um and and so he there's all these stories of him you know saving lives in the stands and games and so forth uh well on, on top of that uh right in the middle of his career right in the middle of his prime he served 19 months in korea as a battalion surgeon and so he was basically in a mass unit on the front lines in the midst of combat, saving lives. And, uh, and so he missed, really, the, his peak years. Um, you know, there's this story that was told later that imagine yourself, you're Bobby Brown, you're going up the, the, uh, the trans, transport, whatever the, 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 the road is into the, into, the, into the country in Korea. And you, he had everything he owned on his back. Uh, at his time, at the same time, his wife Sarah was giving birth to their first son, Pete, and uh, his Yankee team was winning the World Series back in New York, 1953. Um, I was fascinated with Bobby Brown, and when I started to write the book, he, I learned that he was still alive, and so I actually was able to uh, to, to meet him. I was I met the Brown family, and and, and he, he was old, he's 95 at the time, and they said you can talk to him, but there's two rules. Number one, you can't take photos. And number two, the book can't be about him. And this was because he had so much humility. And I, I finally got into his apartment in Fort Worth, uh, and, and, and I left out the fact that after he, he became a licensed physician and he was a cardiologist in Dallas for 25 years, at the end of his career, he was asked to be the manager, the interim general manager of the Texas Rangers for a year, and then became the American League president for 10 years. At the time, Bart Giamatti was commissioner and was very close to Giamatti and was responsible for basically redefining the strike zone. He banned uh, uh, smokeless tobacco from the minor leagues. He did all this stuff. He ended up as George Bush Sr.'s tennis partner. Um, He was the most fascinating man I've ever met, so I couldn't wait to meet him. And I walked in and and shook his hand, and I I was expecting kind of, okay, who are you kind of look. Uh, But I've never seen this kind of integrity combined with kindness before in my life. He was unbelievable. I tried to get him to talk about himself over and over. I said, well, you played on probably the best high school team in the, in the country. He said, well, we had this pitcher named Sheehan who almost never lost, but he was shot down over Korea, or was shot down in World War II over Germany. And, and my, my teammate Jerry Coleman on the Yankees flew uh, bomber missions in Guadalcanal. So he's always deflecting. Always deflecting. And I asked him, you know, I really wanted to get to the bottom of how he was so good in the World Series. And I said, what did you do when you went up to the plate? And he said, I just waited for a good pitch and swung as hard as I could. (laughs) 
and he just wouldn't talk about himself. Um, it was, he, he was the most fascinating man I've ever met in my life. Um, I came away from that meeting knowing I could write this book. And that's what he did to people, everybody around him. Every team he was on, every group he was on, he made just by his presence and his character and his integrity and his kindness and all that stuff, he made everything he did great. Mm. And there wasn't a team or group he was on that wasn't at the very top of, of the game. So um, he passed away early this year, and I had the good fortune to go to his service. Mm. Uh, and that was just a, going to his, his memorial service was a fascinating experience. You know, at, 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 at these services now, they have vid- kind of a running video that's going for everybody to watch. A lot of his is World Series footage of, you know, Joe DiMaggio gets walked and Bobby Brown comes up and hits a base-clearing triple. Um, he shows me, he pulls, he started pulling out things during our interview. He showed me a picture of one of those World Series games and went out of his way to point, all the other, point out all the other players who were in the picture that were in the Hall of Fame. Hmm. Just would not, would not talk about himself. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I, I end up, in the bo- I wrote a, an afterword in the book about Bobby Brown, which is very heartfelt mm, very and very meaningful to me. But I'm not sure I could have done this without him. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, we went over a little bit, but I hope this has been worth it. It's been interesting, and, and I think it's relevant to our topic, and, and we'll have some, a lot of great stuff to unpack in the group. Thanks yeah, you bet, so much, Thank Ted. You. you bet. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Let me go ahead and close this in prayer. Lord, thank you for uh, this rich time. Uh, may you use this uh, interesting uh, information and fodder for our groups so that we can continue to leverage how do we work best in groups, how do we work best to run for the prize together uh, as believers in Christ, as men of God. Uh, how do you align us to where we can be stronger as teams than we could ever be uh, on our own. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen.